Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome again to Bhavana Society. Today, we gathered here not to celebrate birthday. We are here to see a new book. It is book launch. In the beginning, we start uh, meritorious deeds to share merits with departed relatives, friends, family members, as well as our uh, members. So this is the way how we have to celebrate birthdays. So it is not my advice. This is the advice given by the Buddha. So, but now you all are here, venerable monks and our uh, friends, Dharma friends, all are here to participate a book launch. The name of this book is Depending Origination in Plain English. You might remember last year also we had the same kind of uh, book launch. And on that day we were promising each and every birthday to publish a new book. So that is my goal. So you all are here today to listen to some people who know something about that book as well as you like to see the background story, the way how it's prepared. And also you like to hear something from Bhante Ji regarding that book. So uh, keeping these old thoughts in your mind, your formal way, I would like to welcome Venerable Mahasangha. Uh, I don't want to mention all the names of this Mahasangha. Most of you all already know. Uh, all the Mahasangha, Bhikkuni and Bhikkhu and Samaneris, all the Mahasangha I would like to welcome on behalf of Bahavana Society. As well as all our Dharma friends, particularly 100% uh, who are here, Bhanteji's students, who are following Bhanteji's guidance, as well as who are joining with Bhanteji's classes, coming here to practice Dhamma. So, we would like to welcome you all. According to our agenda, we don't want to spend more than uh, uh, one hour. We are planning to end this session, this events within in one hour. Uh, because I know a lot of, I mean, who are here today coming from different cities. And uh, uh, I, you know, the people who prepared lunch today, they came from all the way the, from New Jersey. It is kind of tradition for them. They started this tradition. They are continuing this tradition. They they like to come to on Bhanteji's birthday to perform this meritorious deed, to cook food and to share with others. So having that devout full thoughts, I don't know the how we how the how they do these things because uh, last day yesterday they did work in their places, and they came here around. Uh, 10.30 p.m. or 11.30 p.m. Right away, they start the procedure. Then in the morning, they offer dana. I don't know how they did that. I don't know whether they sleep last night or not. But we had delicious food. The morning as well as and lunchtime. So, and some other friends from Maryland, Virginia, and Virginia, all other places. So, we don't want to take much time, but we all are like to hear the background story regarding this new publication. Uh, so welcoming you all, I would like to invite to give a keynote speak, uh, Douglas John Imbrano. He is one of long time Bhavana friends as well as Bantejis. He was a former board member in long time. And uh, Douglas had done some works with Bhante Ji regarding his publications. 
few years ago, you you can see the books that uh, published uh, uh, with uh, Douglas. Why, what, how, and I start here in uh, these two books. Uh, Banteji did with uh, Douglas, and particularly listening to Banteji's uh, talks, Douglas prepared these two books, and those books published same company, Wisdom Company two years, three years ago. So he has a lot of experience listening to Banteji as well as having formal and informal discussions with Banteji and using all these knowledge and experience. And last two, two weeks ago, he was here with another person to make a documentary productions kind of documentary productions and then uh, he said Bhante we are going to have an interview Bhante ji about his new book which is ready to come out today uh, depending origination in plain English so then I asked him okay now you have discussed with Bhante ji about this book and already you started to do some kind of studies regarding this book. Now you are making a documentary about that. So then why you are not becoming a keynote speaker in this uh, gathering? So he said, do you believe Bhante? Can I do it? I said, why not? I have confidence. So then we both agree. So then he is here today. I don't want to take much time. Do, Don Douglas, this is your time. Please come. Can you hear me okay? All I will say is beware when Bhante Sadajiwa corners Bhav in the library. I'm going to get into a little background leading up to the book, all the way back to the founding of this place. I first came to Bhavana Society in 1989 as a journalist. I was a newspaper feature editor for the Charleston Gazette in the capital city of West Virginia and heard of this curious conundrum five hours to the east of me, deep in the Appalachian Hills. A full-on Buddhist monastery had sprung up on a back road in Bible Belt, West Virginia. Hmm. Back then, I possessed only a cursory comprehension of Buddhism and the Buddhist teachings, although I had long been intrigued by what I understood to be the Dhamma's way of looking at the world. At the time, I did not know this Pali pronunciation of the more familiar Sanskrit word Dharma, referring to the body of the Buddhist teachings, or that this monastery was of the Theravada Buddhist tradition, the way of the elders, if you look at the etymology of Tara and Vada and that the Forest Monastery's co-founder and abbot was a Theravada Buddhist monk of some renown from Sri Lanka. When I was growing up in the latter half of 20th century suburban America, perhaps the most likely place you might encounter this word was in the title of the book Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac, one of the crown princes of the beat movement, whose often outlandish, convention-defying, in-your-face antics thumbed a nose at straight-laced society. The beats were intent on forging another freer path through life, and your rules, expectations, and conventions stood in the way. Was being a Kerouacian Dharma bum somehow reflective of the spirit of Buddhist behavior and thought? I myself had grown up Roman Catholic in my long red cassock and white surplus, very monk-like. I served compliantly as an altar boy from fifth to eighth grades at possibly the most Catholic sounding school in all of Ohio, Our Lady of the Rosary. Yet by my early teen years, beset by an inquisitive questing mind, an autodidact in the world's literature, mythology, and faith traditions, I began a long walkabout exit from Catholicism, away from its confounding to me tales of virgin births and crucified sons of bearded gods. The questing, flexible mind of the great American Trappist monk, Thomas Merton, birthed the book that I came upon, Zen and the Birds of Appetite, which boldly drew comparisons and correlations between the monotheism of Christianity and the left-field, godless spiritual approach of Zen Buddhism. For years, I carried that book in my satchel since it felt like a passport to an appealing, distant country 
the way of seeing things of the spirit that were as yet half formed and not yet clear to me. So that was sort of my state of mind and experience when I first showed up in late October 1989 at age 32 with a photographer in tow for a weekend of interviews and poking around this new intriguing place. Co-founded in 1985 by Bantiji and Matthew Flickstein, Bhavana had only just opened its doors to the public earlier that year of my initial visit. There were four monks in residence, Bhanteji, Bhante Yogavacho Rahula, Bhante Ananta Bodhi, and Bhante Sona, a 35-year-old Canadian ordained by Bhanteji in July of that year, the abbot's first ordination of a bhikkhu or male monk. Also in residence was Sister Sama, who had been ordained that July as a samaneri, a novice Buddhist nun, as part of Bhantiji's initial pioneering efforts to revive the order of Theravada bhikkhunis, or nuns. I will leave for another day and for someone else an examination of the tale of that fraught, thorny, ultimately frustrated, and yet worthy effort, except to note that the order of Theravada bhikkhunis is growing well today, with Bhantiji continuing to encourage its expansion. The ordinations, the study of the Buddhist teachings in both English and Pali, and the full throttle construction to Bhantiji's, spoke to Bhantiji's ambitions for, Bhavanas, for the Bhavana Society in the world. Monks banged hammers and framed walls, long power cords, snake to chainsaws, used to clear space in the Appalachian woods for new kutis or cabins, popping up on the property like mushrooms after a rain. Bhantiji was age 62 upon our first interview which is worth noting. After all, by age 60, many lay folk are contemplating which easy chair to collapse into so as to watch the world pass by as they look forward to blissful retirement. Of course, the mission of the Bhavana Society is a different sort of bliss, a more lasting kind. Here's how I describe this place in the story about this new forest monastery that I wrote upon returning home in 1989. Under Bhante Gunaratna's direction, the monks study the Buddhist teachings and the Pali language, along with frequent sessions of vipassana or insight meditation. They meditate not to tune out reality, a common Western stereotype. Their aim is to face the ever-changing nature of reality itself, which Buddhists believe is entirely dependent upon the mind. The philosopher Descartes once wrote, I think, therefore I am. A Buddhist might say, the way I think is the way I am. It's no small matter the word that Bhanteji chose to christen this new frontier in Western Buddhism here at the foot of Great North Mountain along the eastern front of the Allegheny Mountain Range. The barest bones description of the barest bones definition of bhavana signifies mental development. Yet in preparing to write something for this, his 96th birthday celebration, I texted Bhanteji asking him for his current favorite explication of this nuanced Pali word. Here's what he texted back, being the thoroughly modern Macintosh and Apple-centric monk that he is, even while being one of the great early Buddhist text teachers in the world today. The meaning of bhavana, Bhanteji texted, is the cultivation of mind for the realization of the true nature of everything. Now, if you think about it, that definition is as good a shorthand, shorthand as anything for what has been going on in this Back Hills Monastery and retreat center for nigh on 40 years, an ongoing and significant turning of the wheel of Dhamma, all kicked into gear by an abbot now marking his 96th year on this day. In the intervening years from my first visit until this moment, Bhanteji has been a little busy. He has crisscrossed the world teaching. He has inspired, instructed, and guided thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lay people, monks, and nuns in beginning, in developing, and in deepening their spiritual practice. And he has written a few books. Well, he has written a lot of books. His first widely distributed one, the now classic Mindfulness in Plain English, has been translated into more, thir into more than 30 languages. I encourage you to check out the Bhavana Library shelves organized by Judy Larson to see a host of Bhanteji's books in at least 30 languages other than English. And on this day, courtesy of his publisher Wisdom, we celebrate the delivery of some advanced copies of a book to be released in 2024 on dependent origination, one of the Buddha's most significant yet perhaps least understood or discussed of his teachings, at least in the world of popular Buddhist discourse, 
which is why this book is so important, written by the perfect interlocutor to lift up a conversation about this consequential teaching. As for myself, as a founding member of the Stumblebum Setback and Pratfall School of Lay Buddhism, I will not attempt in my own words to sketch dependent origination. Instead, I defer to Bhantiji's acuity and keenness of thought. Here are some excerpts from the new book co-produced with Veronique Ziegler. Dependent origination is like a domino effect. Everything gradually falls when one link topples. It starts with ignorance. And so with the dissolution of ignorance, all the steps of dependent origination leading to sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair disappear as well. Therefore, understanding ignorance and how to end it irreversibly is the way to live a life free from suffering. Nothing happens in isolation. When this arises, this arises. But being gripped by ignorance, we are not able to see this. And therefore, ignorance is not knowing dependent origination. We generate our joy and, and our misery by the way we think. Here again, we find the explicit manifestation of the dependent origination formula in our daily lives. If we are not skillful enough, our mind can make us believe that we are something we are not. Ignorance is very good at deceiving us that way. And if it is powerful enough, we will not know that we are being deceived, making it even more difficult for us to escape from this deception. It is possible to spend our entire life deluded by our own mental formations. Good intention by itself is not enough. It must also be accompanied with wisdom. These intricacies demand our full mindful attention in order for us to maintain a wholesome state of mind and act skillfully. Whatever prevents us from cleansing, freeing, and fully liberating our minds must be avoided at all costs. Suffering does not arise independently. It arises based on certain conditions. And when those conditions are eliminated, it ceases. This, in short, is the teaching of dependent origination, and it leads to the complete elimination of ignorance, the cause of suffering. As long as ignorance is there, suffering is there. As long as greed, hatred, and delusion are there, suffering is there. If you want to get rid of your suffering, remove greed, hatred, and delusion from your mind. The general belief during the Buddha's lifetime, just as today, was that suffering just happened by accident or that it was created by oneself, others, or a combination of these. But dependent origination demonstrates that everything is conditioned, that nothing comes into existence independently without causes and conditions. It is a deep, elaborate, and comprehensive teaching that leads us to a profound understanding of ourselves and ultimately a state of absolute inner peace and serenity. So in conclusion, I wanna share one very important point. The Buddha exhorted us to not associate with the foolish, to always associate with the wise until the time we attain enlightenment. So it is a good thing indeed to be in this good place and to share the benefits on the occasion of Bhantiji's 96th birthday of associating with his good and wise company. One of my favorite Pali phrases, because of its harmonious lilt and what it signifies, is kalyanamita, which means a spiritual or admirable friend. Kalyanamitas are not just good buddies. They are essential for our spiritual development. How essential? The Upada Sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya of the Pali Canon describes a conversation between the Buddha and his faithful attendant Ananda, who sometimes serves as a foil to make important points in the Pali Canon. Ananda wakes up one day, he's all excited to share with the Buddha this brilliant insight that has flowered in his mind. He corners the Buddha's attention and enthusiastically declares, this is half of the holy life, Lord, admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie. Now imagine Ananda's face as the great teacher says, no, you've got it all wrong, man, and tells him never to utter those words. What? What? As the sutta continues, the Buddha responds. Don't say that, Ananda. Don't say that. Admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie is actually the whole of the holy life. When a monk has admirable people as friends, companions, and comrades, he can be expected to develop and pursue the Noble Eightfold Path, which leads us to enlightenment. The Buddha is thus a Kalyanamita pointing to the way that we must then follow. It's the only way it can be followed. For so many of us in this room and across the world, Bhantiji has for so long been our great Kalyanamita. 
And may we pass it forward and be Kalyanamitas to our friends, companions, and compatriots along the way. Since I've been running my mouth for a bit, let's take a moment now of silence, taking in a deep breath. Here then is a final reminder, one you will hear from Bhantiji's lips when he concludes, as he did this morning, morning meditations in this very room. There is no concentration without wisdom, no wisdom without concentration. One who has both wisdom and concentration is close to peace and emancipation. And so let us dedicate our efforts this day and throughout however many days we have left to us in this life to emulate the example of the life of Bhante Hinapola Gunaratana Mahatera, to work for our own liberation and the liberation of all beings. I conclude with an excerpt of a loving friendliness meditation you may also hear coming from Bhante Ji's lips. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. May the suffering be free from suffering so too may all beings be. From the highest realms of existence to the lowest, may all beings arisen in these realms, with form and without form, visible or invisible, born or coming to birth, be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So far, Douglas recognized as an excellent writer. Since today, everybody recognizes you as a good speaker. So, thank you very much, Douglas. And now it is time to see the book. Bhante Ji is already signed all the books is ready to distribute all these books. First, representing two things, I would like to invite two monks. With these two monks, there is a background story. The background story is one Bhante coming from Vidyalankara Pirivana. Vidyalankara Pirivana monastic training school is the training school where Bhante, Bhante Ji study. So representing all the Vidyalankara teachers, including uh, Yakkadwe Patnya Ramanayaka Mahathera, uh, Babarande Sirisivili Thera, Valpala Rahula Thera, and uh, all other teachers, well, well recognized, worldwide well recognized teachers, representing all of them. To respect them as a token, I would like to invite Venerable Nadagami Panyaloka Thera to receive a book from Banteji. And the second invitation for Venerable Deepankar, Okampiti Deepankar Thera. Okampiti Deepankar Thera is one of uh, Venerable coming from uh, Padhanagara Pirivana. Uh, Padhanagara Pirivana is the monastic training school started by Paravahar Vajratnana Nayaka Maha Thera. Uh, Paravahar Vajratnana Nayaka Thera was uh, one of another pillar of Bhante Ji's life. Uh, Paravahara Nayaka Hamudra was the person who established uh, missionary training school in Sri Lanka. So Bhante Ji studied under the guidance of Paravahara Vajratnana Nayaka Thera, uh, representing that tradition. I would like to invite Deepankara Thera to receive a book from Bhante Ji. So I would like to invite our board member Paul and Tushara both are here, uh, as well as uh, Christina. 
I saw you were here. Please come forward to offer these new copies to the monks. You can start from side. No, this can you can start from the other side. So I would like to invite uh, some other friends uh, uh, from a uh, book, their copy from Banteji. So I would like to invite uh, Upali Ekanayaka Mahatya. Please come forward. And representing Sri Lankan Embassy, uh, Defense Attache Brigadier Chaminda Lianaga is here. I would like to invite, please receive a copy on behalf of the Ambassador Sri Lanka. And also, I would like to invite our friends. Uh, from New Jersey, please come forward to receive a copy from Banteji Nalin Mahatya. I would like to invite our librarian, Judy, please receive your copy from Banteji. So then I would like to invite again our board members to come and offer others copies. Even though you are not able to take one copy from Banteji, it doesn't matter. Banteji's signature is there. Can we start from here? Can you start? So we don't want to waste our time. Now we would like to invite uh, our venerable friends as well as our brother monk, Dr. Surakulame Premaratana Thera to take this opportunity to talk about something Bhante Ji's missionary works as well as his uh, writings. So venerable sir, Please join with us. My reverential greeting to Bhante Ji and most venerable uh, members of the Mahasangha and all the other uh, friends in the Dhamma. And, and thank you very much. I'm deeply honored uh, to have this brief uh, opportunity uh, to 
uh, express my uh, gratitude and express my uh, ideas about Banpeji's mission uh, in the US. Uh, today on this day, especially when this new book is released, I would like to be briefly um, reflect uh, Bante G's uh, mission uh, in uh, informing uh, what we call American Buddhism. Uh, American Buddhism is, is still in the making. It is uh, not fully fledged yet uh, because it takes a few centuries for any uh, countries any country or any civilization uh, to, to have real synergy uh, with the, the deep teachings of the Buddha and his cultural uh, background. For example, uh, China received Buddhism in second century, but uh, it took about 400 years uh, for China to form uh, a, a Chinese Buddhism with the essence of Buddhist teachings and at the same time its cultural expression. Uh, so when we think about uh, American Buddhism, it is it's still in the making. And I see the, the books written by Bhante Ji, starting with Mindfulness in Plain English and all other books, are actually, actually very important part of making uh, the American Buddhism. Uh, when we think about the history of American Buddhism, we find a few key waves uh, of American Buddhism. As you know that you know uh, in in the U.S. we start to talk about Buddhism for the first time uh, in the middle of 19th century when many uh, Chinese immigrants uh, came to the U.S., uh, uh, particularly the Western West Coast uh, during the time of gold rush. Uh, so when many uh, Chinese immigrants came here and they were traditionally Buddhist and they started. Uh, their own place of worship and so that was the first time you know in, through the history that people there was some presence of buddhism uh, in the u.s but in later towards the end of 19th century again we find uh, japanese migrants uh, arrived here uh, and then uh, and then they also started their own uh, buddhist temples so those are mainly uh, buddhism of asian migrants so that was the first you know, waves of uh, Buddhism to the US. But later, slowly, uh, the people in this country also start to learn and experience uh, Buddhist culture and Buddhism. But what we can see a big wave, uh, another big wave of uh, Buddhist, uh, the awareness of Buddhism in 1950s, when people start to talk about Zen. Uh, in about in 1950s, in with you know, like with the influence of teachers like D.T. Suzuki, uh, people start talk about Zen, and there were many Zen centers were you know popping up, um, and that was one way. And then, if you think about a little bit later, around 1970s, 70s is a very important period where we find number of waves of Buddhism coming to the U.S. Um, one is the Tibetan Buddhism, mainly with the arrival of you know prominent teachers like you know. Uh, Jogyan uh, uh, Trumpa and many other Tibetan teachers, and they started to, you know, uh, educate about uh, uh, Vajrayana form of Buddhism. Uh, and also at the same time, uh, we also find with the, the change of immigration rule in 1965, there are a lot of other uh, Asian professionals arriving in the U.S., and then uh, and some of them were Buddhist, and they were also starting, uh, again, uh, Buddhist temples, but ethnically based. Uh, and then at the same time, in 1976, we find the starting of the, the first uh, Theravada or maybe Vipassana Meditation Center in Massachusetts, uh, the Insight Meditation Society, IMS, uh, by uh, Jack, uh, of course, uh, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield and Sharon, um, okay. yeah, yeah, Sharon Salzburg. Salzburg and other uh, uh, meditation teachers who actually who learned meditation in, in Myanmar, in Thailand, in India, and then came here and started these meditation centers. Actually, so during the 70s, we find this uh, the uh, melting, this US as a melting pot of different Buddhist traditions and, and awareness of different Buddhist traditions and uh, is, is there. It is actually in this uh, decade that Bhante Ji also came to uh, the Washington DC in 1968 and he started to teach meditation in Washington 
uh, Buddhist Vihara and also uh, universities and other places uh, around that area. So 70s is, 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 uh, is an interesting period for people to get to know a little bit more deeper about Buddhism. Uh, and then uh, when it comes to um, uh, 1980s, uh, or 90, actually 1990s, we find the another interesting wave of American Buddhism that is mainly uh, many uh, uh, popular people, particularly celebrities, uh, 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 embracing Buddhism and, and I act like and, uh, and claiming to be friends of Buddhism. So there are a lot of you know actors and actresses and you know singers and many, many popular uh, celebrities. Uh, coming out and talking about Buddhism and sometimes even teaching Buddhism, uh, and you can call it uh, Hollywood Buddhism. <laughs> uh, so that is in 90s. Uh, and then when we think about it in 2000s, actually we find another interesting wave of Buddhism that is uh, the wave of Buddhism that came with the mindfulness movement. And of course, Bhante Ji's book on mindfulness in plain English, uh, which was published originally in 1983, I think, 83, 1991, yeah. And then, however, in, it is only in the 2000s that we find this new uh, in interest and new popularity of, of uh, mindfulness. And then with, with the mindfulness movement and many uh, people came to know about Buddhism and many teachers are rising. Uh, and then we find that movement. So when we think about all these different waves of Buddhism starting from the 19th century all the way right now, we see different... Um, uh, waves and moves, and then the U.S. being the uh, the melting pot and the ground uh, for various Buddhist traditions to come together and form this uniquely uh, American Buddhism. Um, well, one there's one danger whenever Buddhism travels to uh, other countries, it tries to adapt to its local culture. Uh, that is why in different Buddhist countries we have uniquely you know different Buddhist cultures. Uh, because Buddhism does not try to, you know, uh, establish uh, um, uh, uh, a uni uh, establish a, uh, like um, the one uniform uh, culture, but uh, it brings the teachings, the philosophy. But each and every civilization culture can express the teachings of the Buddhists in their own cultural uh, way ways. So therefore, we find uh, different cultural expressions in different countries. So in the U.S. and in America, and uh, we uh, still, as I mentioned before, the Buddhism is in the is still American, uniquely American form of Buddhism is in the making. But whenever Buddhism travels those different cultures, uh, there is a danger that we should be aware of. And somehow in the history, you know, uh, it uh, Buddhists have been aware of it and they have overcome it. That is, whenever you try to adapt to the local culture. We have to make sure that we will not compromise the essence of the teachings of the Buddha. Just because you want to be culturally appropriate, culturally you know, appealing, we should not lose the essence uh, of the Buddhist teaching. So uh, when it comes to the, uh, the US and particularly in the Western countries, uh, there was a danger uh, that whether Buddhism, whether Buddhism is serving um, whether Buddhism is being uh, is serving the the local people, or maybe local people, maybe local culture is using Buddhism to promote its own ideas. And particularly when we can see when we think about the mindfulness movement and um, the individualism is a is a is a part of this capitalist economy. Uh, so we can see how the individualism means that you know I'm going to solve my own problem and. I'm not going to talk to anyone else and I can fix my own problem. Uh, and then I am the... Helping us to overcome our weaknesses and sometimes we use Buddhism and Buddhist concepts to support our weaknesses. So what I see, the, the uniqueness of Bhante Ji's books, he is... He is able to help the American Buddhism not to lose the essence of Buddhism. Uh, he start with mindfulness in plain English book, and then quickly he produced the other book, what we call um, Eight Mindfulness Steps to Happiness, showing that mindfulness alone cannot work. 
you have to have the holistic practice and all other eight items of the path. And then of course he wrote Beyond Mindfulness. Uh, and then he wrote, you know, Four Foundations of Mindfulness uh, in English. Uh, and then uh, of course uh, the other, um, the similarly other key books. So therefore, what Bhante's G's book is helping the American Buddhism to retain the essence of teachings of the Buddha. He is writing in a very simple English. Anyone can understand, anyone can easily make sense what he's telling, but he is not bending Buddhism to be appealing to American audience. That is the uniqueness of Bhante's G's work. Uh, he's writing in a very simple language in terms of the way he expressed himself is very appealing, uh, very, you know, uh, is, is comprehensible. But he's not bending the teachings of the Buddha just to, you know, get popularity. And that's the great thing. I had to, we had to be very, very grateful and thankful to Bhante uh, for maintaining that deep essence of Buddhism and not, not, to, not compromising it just to uh, be popular. So therefore, we can see what the what Bhante Ji's book are telling us actually, not simply uh, to like you know uh, to uh, to promote or maybe like feed our own you know desires and you know and whatever our preferences, uh, but Bhante's books are t helping us to look into our own desires and preferences and and find out what are not helpful, what are helpful and make this you know, important distinction. Therefore, most of the books will you know, try to, for, for example, in, in the US, we, we like freedom. We like you know, individual you know, freedom. So therefore, uh, we, uh, most of the Buddhist practitioners like to you know, practice by themselves and like you know, very you know, alone practice. But we can see in the Bhante's books, you know, there's an emphasis on you know, uh, the concept of Kalyanamitta, just, you know, Douglas just shared with us, and the importance of Sangha, importance of being with the teacher. And so it's not really promoting. His books will be more popular if he simply catered to that, okay, you can practice by yourself. You don't need anyone help. Use my book. That is alone. <laughs> he's not promoting that kind of Buddhism. And he's actually bringing the real essence, as, 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 essence of the Buddhist culture and encouraging everyone to be in the community, be in the Sangha, be with the teachers, and then uh, practice uh, uh, with, with that group support. And then, so in, in that way, what, um, what Bhante's books are telling us, is not simply what we famously call, uh, uh, follow your heart. Usually, you know, we like to say, okay, follow your heart. Uh, but, but Bhante's books are telling us, if you simply follow your heart, uh, you will follow your defilements. <laughs> and what Bhante's books are telling us, not simply follow your heart, but train your heart. Train your heart because heart alone is not necessarily, you know, um, of course, there's inherent goodness in us, but our heart is not simply always good. You know, it's, it's be, it has been conditioned by all this sankhara and all these, you know, habitual patterns. So he's not telling us to follow your heart. You know, the, that will be the more American way of, uh, you know, practice, practicing it, but he's helping us to train our heart. So there we, therefore, we will not lose the essence of the teachings of the Buddha. So on this special day, and especially today, this is the new book, The Dependent Origination in Playing English, again, emphasizing the same, the, the essence of the Buddhism. And although it is very intricate, difficult subject and topic, and he is explaining it simple language, but not losing the essence of it, and his goal is not to become popular, not to become appealing to the American audience, but actually train and teach and guide the American audience to the real essence, uh, the essence of Buddhism. So therefore, I truly uh, thankful and grateful to Bhante Ji for maintaining that deep essence of Buddhism and at the same time being the best-selling author. <laughs> so thank you very much, Bhante, for preserving this deep essence of Buddhism to us. And, and you are very important part of uh, making the American Buddhism. So your books and your teachings will one day will be uh, will be remembered as the the most uh, important ingredients, important factor that make the American Buddhism the American Buddhism. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Venerable Sir. So. Uh, in this book, I think you all can see there's another author named Veronique. 
I think she's also here in this audience. So why we are not listening to her about her experience writing a book with Banteji? So Dr. Veronique, she's uh, also our board member as, as well as she's the secretary for the board. So I would like to invite you to come to this podium to share your experience. Honorable Mahasanga, dear friends, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how this book came about. And this all started, it was just before the pandemic. And at the time, we used to have Pali classes with Bontiji on Saturday afternoon. And um, this was before we would broadcast over Zoom. This was in person. And um, Bantiji had just started on the profound topic of dependent origination. And just before year end, we had just a couple of classes just before year end on dependent origination. And um, Bantiji called me and he said that he wanted to write a book on dependent origination, but he wanted these teachings to be really accessible to people, to be very relevant to their lives, to be really lively, to be written in a simple language that everybody could understand. And he told me the story of how uh, the book Mindfulness in Plain English came about. And what he told me is that in the same way for mindfulness in plain English, it started as a series of lectures that Vantaji was giving on the topic of meditation and mindfulness. And some of the students in that class urged him to turn this into a book so that it could reach a wider audience of people. And so uh, the way this used to work is um, these lectures were transcribed and then eventually turned into chapters. And then this became a book, but not just any book. This book has been recognized as one of the foremost manuals on mindfulness and meditation by the New York Times. Um, there was um, a review of people that were expert in these fields and everybody agreed that this is the foremost text on this topic. And um, it's been translated, have you, as you've heard, in many, many languages, I think 34 in all. And um, so this is a classic on the topic. And it was the first one in this Plain English series. And this one is also another book in this same series, the Plain English series. And um, so I would also like to share with you, um, you know, how I how I felt when Bantiji asked me to do this. Um, first of all, I was very humbled. I was I was floored. I was on cloud nine for many days because um, this was such a monumental task for me. Um, it was so important to be interested in this, and I sense I still sense that this was one of the most monumental occurrences in my life. And uh, I just want to spend a, um, just a few minutes just to share with you what I've learned uh, doing this work. And I'm still learning this, um, by the way. And what I've learned is that what one must do is actually learn to see dependent origination in ourselves, that it's actually a self-exploration process to see um, what is happening here and now in our own mind and body complex. Um, and also one can ask the question, um, why do I suffer? You know, our daily experience is suffering, it's dissatisfaction. If you look at yourself, you see at every little moment we have this little dissatisfaction. And um, I started looking at my own life in the light of these teachings on dependent origination. And starting to see what dependent means. Dependent just means that the arising of one thing depends on another. Uh, the formula is uh, uh, this being this is, from the arising of this, this arises. And this is 
the first lesson that we had with Bantaji on this topic, and Bantaji made it very clear that the, the, the proper word is this, not that, because you have to look at what's happening inside yourself. Now, right here is happening all right here. Um, and so what I realized looking at my own situations in life is that every disappointment that I've had comes from greed, from being attached so, to something. And why did I get attached? Um, I am got attached because of not seeing things as they are, because of not understanding dependent origination, because of not seeing the Four Noble Truth and the characteristics of existence, that everything is impermanent, unsatisfactory and selfless. And so I started to see how this caused my own suffering from greed born out of ignorance. And I started to see within myself how um, this arising uh, of ignorance uh, led to the arising of volition regarding forms, sounds, sights, smells, um, taste, tactile objects, and how through a series of dependently arises, uh, dependently arising causes and condition, this led to my own sorrow. And seeing this, I learned to catch myself before going down to the, the, the rabbit hole of ignorance. And this was a very important lesson in, in my life. And so working on this book um, has been the most impactful event uh, in my life. And I'm ever grateful to Bantaji for this opportunity to serve him to the best of my capacity uh, in his dispensation of the Buddha Sasana. And I would like also to express my heartfelt thanks to Bantaji, uh, to the entire Mahasangha, uh, to the Bhavana monastic community, and to all to all of you uh, attending this event today, uh, either in person or over Zoom, and uh, to all the friends and supporters of Bhavana. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Veronique. So. We have a guest all the way from Australia. So there is a connection with that guest. That connection is he was a former president of Vidyalankara Sabha, Vidyalankara Society, where Bhante Ji graduated in monastic training school. So he's an executive member representing Vidyalankara Pirivana and the tradition, I would like to invite Mr. Lalit De Silva to take the opportunity to speak a few words. Founding abbot of Bahana Society, most venerable Dr. Henapura Gundradna Mahatera, venerable abbot of Bahana Society, vice abbot of Bahana Society, most venerable Dr. Sadhajiva Tera, distinguished members of the Sangha and nuns and friends. Good afternoon. Today we have gathered not only to make the passing of another year 
but to celebrate the wisdom, compassion, and guidance embodied by our esteemed monk, Manteji, on this remarkable occasion of his 96th birthday. I am privileged to address you on this momentous day as immediate past president of Vidyalankar Piruana. Actually, Vidyankar Piruana is the number one monastic training school in Sri Lanka for those who are not aware. So, my introduction to the life of Bhante Ji came from the former director and principal of the Vidyalankar Mahapiruvana and the Chancellor of Kalaniya University, the most venerable late Dr. Valimitya Kusardhamma Mahanayakatera 20 years ago. When he spoke about prominent past students of Vidyalankar Mahapiruvana, Bhante Ji stood among the top alongside the venerable Pratmalane Dhamma Rama Mahathera, Professor Panyakiti Mahathera, Dunupakune Dhamma Nanda Thera, Thiruvattari Panyana Thera, Valpala Rahul Thera and others. Subsequently, in 2018, I delved deeper into Bhante Ji's noble work and the life through the teaching and the insight shared by Bhante Sant Sadda Jeeva in Sri Lanka. This additional source has profoundly enriched my appreciation of Bhante Ji's significant contribution to Dhamma, highlighting the impactful journey he has undertaken, shaping the course of Theravada Buddhism globally. My wife and I are fortunate enough to personally experience the wonders of this noble organization within a span of the two days. The high energy and blissful environment left a lasting impression, further affirming the significance of Bhantiji's teaching and the positive influence of the community he has cultivated. Reflecting Bhantiji's teaching remains a source of profound enrichment, offering timeless wisdom of Dhamma. His words, like ripples in the serene ponds, resonate with compassion and loving kindness, embodying the values of altruism, empathy, generosity, and mindfulness. He stands as a true leader, seamlessly living the principles he imparts. Nayakatera's teaching have become invaluable more than ever in this volatile, uncertain, competitive, and complex world addressing the challenges encountered by the governments, companies, families, and individuals alike. His profound wisdom offers valuable insight for navigating the complexities of modern world, fostering well-being on both organizations and individual levels. On this auspicious day, let us express our deepest gratitude for Mahanayaka Thera's selfless dedication to the teaching of the Buddha aimed at alleviating suffering of people. His journey stands as a testament to the transformative power of, of a life devoted to noble power of life devoted to noble principles. May the candles of Nayaka Thera's birthday symbolize the illumination he has brought into the lives of millions of Buddhists and non-Buddhists from around the world. As we light them, let us also ignite the flame of wisdom within ourselves, carrying for the torch of enlightenment that Bhante has so graciously held high. In the spirit of metta, let us join the hearts in wishing Mahanayaka Terras birthday filled with peace, joy, and the boundless love that he has continually shared with all of us. Direct and Parivanadipati of Vidyalankara Mahapirivan Kalambo and Halavata Mahasanga Nayaka Thera, most well of Alimitya Kusar Dharma too sent his warm wishes this morning and he could not contact Nayaka Thera personally due to some uh, telecommunication issues. 
happy birthday venerable sir may your teaching continues to illuminate the noble path for billions and may your days be filled with the serenity you have graciously bestowed upon others may the blessings of triple gem always be with you teruan sarnai and thank you thank you very much lalit mahatya so now we got opportunity to listen to bante ji without listening to bante ji how we can live from this meditation hall it's not happening we not supposed to do that so uh, let's listen to bante ji on his 96th birthday this is not something that you can experience in your life someone who is celebrating 96 years of birthday giving a talk even in the morning we started with bante ji's uh, thought of the day so let's see what he has to share with us today in this moment एक्सप्रेस माई ग्रेटिट्यूड टू ऑल ऑफ यू For organizing this uh, uh, book launching ceremony on my birthday, I if if I don't have readers, I don't write books. There have to be people who. to people who read what i write if they don't read then we will not be encouraged to write we don't i don't know very much but i can see that there are people who teach me i learn from people i learn from teaching as uh, veronic mentioned the this book as well as mindfulness in plain english are my lectures mindfulness in plain english when i was in washington bihar i gave talks every saturday and somebody recorded these talks and said bante this is very good material why don't you publish it same thing happened to me when i was at the american university we had to write and take a, a english course the first year students have to take english course at the end of the year the professor asked me to write a paper when i produced submitted my paper the professor said this is a very good material why don't you publish it that was my first book so i sent it to malaysia then venerable damanand published it 
is title is come and see and then when i that encourage me to write when i was in washington dc when i gave these talks a friend of mine called john pedicott he lived in baltimore he came to my class and uh, recorded my talks and then he said this is good material why don't you publish it mm -hmm. then i said this my english is not good enough to publish a book he said don't worry about it i edit it he took all what he recorded edited re-recorded and sent it to me then i had a dictaphone you know dictaphone there is a you put the cassette in a little machine there's a pedal you 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 press the pedal and then you listen to it and then type i had a little computer i typed to the computer and made uh, many copies then i was teaching meditation there then i gave uh, this made copies i gave to them and asked them to read them and tell me if there were any mistakes so they read it corrected it put their with their inputs they returned and i corrected them again so i did this for about 10 times <laughs> then i had a uh had friends they edited finally a man working in the usa today as an editor he also was in my class he edited this and then i went to wish them publication uh first i sent it to taiwan they published uh, 10000 copies free of charge two copies i one copy i sent to Do joseph goldstein another copy to uh, larry rosenberg both of them approached wisdom publication and then they said this is a very wonderful book why don't you publish it <laughs> so wisdom publication accepted and they published that is how mindfulness in plain english came into being in 1991 since then it has been published almost every year many millions of copies and that encouraged me to write so when i saw readers then i was encouraged to write all other books i wrote out of that at the request of wisdom publication this one also my lectures as veronica said every saturday i gave the matot they came she came she recorded and then finally we decided to publish it friends my principle is to write speak in a very simple language so that learned people as well as not so learned people can understand if i write in a very long style deep bombastic words then only certain selected people can understand so my principle is to write everything in simple english i don't know deep big words i know simple english so i write simple english 
and therefore i plan to write another book in simple english if i can as long as i can think and write and talk until i die i like to write that has become a sort of my hobby you know when i was learning english i never thought of writing even an essay but it came so naturally as i grew up began to associate with people having conversation with them seeing the dhamma reading the dhamma books i got ideas when i'm walking i have ideas i write these ideas sometimes i kept a little notebook sometimes i had my a cell phone and i record in my cell phone fortunately some of my friends and relatives gave me phones i didn't buy cell phones i thought of using them for teaching dhamma and when i return my work i type these ideas into my computer this is an all from the dhamma that i have learned buddhist teaching is so deep so great even a billion people write books is still they cannot exhaust the teachings of the buddha so much is there to read to learn i don't know very much i know only very tiny little a little drop of buddha teaching and i therefore i know from that how deep that teaching is i like to share it with people if i learn this and die without sharing i think that will be a loss to people and therefore whatever little i know i try to put it in writing therefore friends it is very is in its great encouragement that you all came and organized this and uh, i wish you all read this book and uh, if you can send me your remarks ideas so that we can improve this book when we publish next time this is not the final edition this is as you see at the end of the book this is a very special advanced edition of dependent origination advanced edition only for this occasion vishal publication is so cooperative with me that when i ask them to send me some copies to distribute on my birthday they listen to it on their own expenses they send or they they 
they had some problems in publishing in printing press and therefore they were a little behind in sending me. So Veronica and I contacted them and asked them to send some copies for this occasion. And yesterday we got this book. They were so wonderful. We must thank them for sending overnight for me to distribute this book today with my signature. And I, I thank my student, Sadhajiva, Bhante Sadhajiva, who organized this. I did not know who will bring dana, which monk would come, how many people will come, who the speakers are, all he kept in secret to give me a surprise. He always does like that. This uh, book launching ceremony is his, his idea. I hate birthday celebrations. I never wanted to have a birthday celebration. But he likes it. <laughs> So he organized it. Instead of calling it birthday celebration, he gave a new title, book launching ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> Little palatable to me. And I thank you very much for coming and participating in this little ceremony. And I must thank all these venerable monks. They came from far away places uh, to show their friendship, their brotherhood, and give me their blessings. They came and gave me their blessings. Uh, and give me uh, their uh, support. If I live, I'll write another book next year. And thank you very much for organizing. Bhante Jiva and all other wonderful monks for attending this. You all coming and participating in this and giving me your blessings and your encouragement. Thank you very much. I thank you for you coming here and joining with us for the few good blessings from the team. Uh, even though this is not a birthday celebration, as uh, uh, students, monks, and all these friends, monks are here uh, to show their gratitude as well as to bless upon our great teacher. Today, uh, it is a kind of a remarkable day. A uh, few weeks, few months ago, actually, we got a letter from Sri Lanka. One of the uh, pre school teachers wrote the letter to Bhante Ji asking some support uh, in Kandy area by Maya Academy, actually, uh, up country of the country. Uh, she was explaining. The difficulties that he was facing uh, without a uh, um, good building to stay with that little kids, three to four, uh, five years old kids. So then 
That letter was there in Pate's room. Uh, I have been noticing going here and there. Somehow, uh, I was noticing this AIM letter. There should be something. Sometimes uh, some relatives are sending letters and things. I did not uh, care much of that. But anyway, somehow I asked, is this letter one? Then he said, okay, they can look it. Then I took it and I read it. Then it is something regarding kind of request, kind, very innocent request from uh, one of the Montessori teacher. He does not have a building. He has uh, students. But they are running the Montessori school with the help of you other people, and they see asking if you can build us a, a kind of hall for us to keep our Montessori that would be wonderful support for us. So then right away I called them and I got all the information. I passed this message, our scholarship fund president, Dr. Kasita Vijayasekar, who is in Sri Lanka these days. And then he right away contact that teacher and that uh, uh, government agent in that area and collected all the information. And luckily, last week I got a message from Mr. Asita. He said, Bhante, you know what happened? They all agreed, they passed the plan, they everything did, and uh, the Montessori teacher and the, uh, her supporters went to a place to find the time for the ground rain. Exactly they gave December sun. Mm -hmm. So then today in the morning in Sri Lanka, they did ground rain ceremony with the, with the participants of a few of our, a few of our friends, a few of our friends. And we started it. We are, hope, we are hoping to finish that building in January. So I'm planning to go there to you know, do some other works. And this is also in my calendar. To open that building. So, uh, even though December 7 is not something celebrated, but it is a species thing. That is not my problem. <laughs> we have to do something on that thing. Even I would like to invite you all, even in 2024, December 7th also, there might be a book launch in here. I know our friends from New Jersey and our Vietnam friends are waiting to cook on that. Yeah? <laughs> How I can know this? I don't want to miss this chance. And all other friends also here like to come to take that first copy of book. So we have to fulfill their desire. <laughs> so these are the reasons to have this opportunity. She don't want to celebrate the birthday. So, not of me, is there. So, particularly in here, we have a lot of monks from different places. We have monks from Canada. We have monks from Washington State. Monks from Washington State. And we have monks from India, Sri Lanka, and Virginia and Pittsburgh. So all the monks are here with a very clean mind, pure mind, to bless Bandeji, great our teacher. So we all are following the footprints of our teacher, great teacher. So I would like to invite the monks to join with us to do brief chanting, blessings upon our great teacher for his long life, happy life, as well as uh, to maintain wonderful, great health. Having that aspiration, let us do chanting. I would like to invite to the uh, Surakku and Pevala container to do this chanting. Uh, 
Really? Yeah. 